So, <clears throat> where to start? Well, I think there's, for, you know, Adorno, Theodore Adorno, um, who I've been working on for sort of 10 years plus now. Um, yeah, much more than 10 years ago. Uh, has a reputation in musicology and cultural studies. And, uh, a lot of sort of disparate areas he, um, he has a reputation. Um, and, and he sort of has a reputation in philosophy too. He's certainly known in philosophy departments. Um, there are there are areas in which he, he is not sort of taken seriously, in. and I guess you know if I, was, if I were to situate if I were to situate my book in in, a, in the context of um, philosophical scholarship, there have been a number of uh, books in recent years that have tried to you know take him seriously as um, a philosopher, particularly in relation to philosophy of language um, and what philosophers like to call epistemology, the study of knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, th this has been a movement that has taken place. Usually, um, I say usually, there was a long time where, where aesthetic theory was seen as sort of the, the key for thinking of, about Adorno. And if, if you were going to study Adorno, you'd read aesthetic theory, um, some of the lectures and, and sort of minimum moralia as, as well, I guess. But the, you know, the, the more sort of directly philosophical in the narrow sense works um, were not really, um, I think, given a fair hearing. And primarily among those is negative dialectic. Um, and the meta-critique of epistemology um, as well, which is translated as against epistemology, which is on Edmund Husserl. And I think to take Adorno seriously means to return to these works as opposed as well to the explicitly aesthetic works. Um, so that's sort of part of what I was trying to do, and to rescue a philosophical project in those works um, in, in the book. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and what I've done since then and what I'm trying to do now is really to come back to aesthetic theory. Uh, and, and what I think has, has emerged, at least for me, is, is, the, is that, of course, for Adorno, you know, aesthetics is something like, you know, aesthetics or the philosophy of art is something like a critique of our ordinary practices, the, the ordinary ways in which we know things, um, our ordinary sort of structures of knowing things. And that means our, you know, our social scientific vocabulary, um, and what counts as, as a structure for knowing something in our individual disciplines as, as well. For Adorno, aesthetics is somehow a critique of that. And I think, you know, going back to negative dialectic, um, and the metacritic of epistemology has, I, I think, allowed me to see more of why that actually should be um, the case and how aesthetics can be a kind of critique. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about that as, as well. But what I think, what I think is, is crucial and, and what I really rely on in, in, in the book um, is, a, is a really a, a central distinction between what philosophy does or how philosophy can be a and there's sort of the, the standard way, which is to um, you know construct the set of concepts in order to criticize something, and that's what that's what we all do in the ordinary sense. You know, if we want to understand something, we, we want to create a set of concepts that we can use so that we can sort of um, make sense of what is at stake when we're analyzing something. Um, so whatever it is, when we're looking at you know, violence or if, you know, philosophically we're looking at knowledge, we construct a set of concepts about that in order to understand something. Now, the distinction I, I, I really develop here is that that we need to oppose to another type of, of knowing something, which is not that you understand something with concepts, but that in the process of using concepts, you express something in the process of trying to understand something with concepts. What I mean by that is there are two things going on at the same time. There is, on the one hand, um, something that you know in virtue of using concepts. And on the other hand, there is something that is expressed, which happens as well in the process of using concepts. Now, one way of thinking about expression is sort of Freud's way of thinking about it as sort of you know, something unconscious that comes to the surface when you use concepts. So sometimes, you know, just ordinarily, we all sort of say something or we understand something, um, you know, we articulate something, and then we realize we've said something else in the process of saying it. 
right? We, there was something else which we didn't mean to say, but really we did mean to say it, you know, if we sort of thought about it deeply. So we sort of betray ourselves in saying something. So it's, it's that sense in which sometimes, you know, that's one way of playing this out. In, in using our language, we say things with con concept, but at the same time we express something that we um, didn't explicitly intend to say, but is nonetheless the deeper truth of what it was that we said. Um, and what I think, when Adorno reads philosophers, who, whoever they happen to be, whether it's Kant or, or Hegel or Husserl, um, always Germans, you know, whenever he reads philosophers, they, What's going on is always there's this process of, you know, something, you know, there's a sort of understanding of what they're trying to do. So, you know, if it's reading um, Hegel, there's an understanding of, uh, you know, what, what the phenomenology is about, what's, what's happening there, and so on. But under the surface, there's something that finds expression in that philosopher, which that philosopher is not themselves aware of. Okay? And so it's, it's sort of, it's finding the deep truth within a philosophy that comes to expression. So what I'm trying to do um, in the book when I look at particularly Wittgenstein and, and ben, uh, Walter Benjamin, um, who was hugely influential for Adorno, is to try and sort of play out that idea of something that is expressed um, through the explicit content of a, of a philosophy. Um, and then I, I sort of go on to, to look at the way that also emerges in um, Adorno's critique of Husserl, and I think it's also present in Henri Bergson, um, who's another early 20th century French philosopher, um, and Marcel Proust as, as well. And I'm trying to get at this sense of philosophy as sort of, you know, philosophical writing as a process in which something happens, um, in which something happens which is, you know, more than a kind of conceptual knowledge. Um, and if we can sort of make sense of that, what I really want to say, and, and you know, sort of where I want to go eventually beyond beyond this book, is to say that there's an idea of critical thought here, um, which I think is is really the essence of critical thought itself. When we think about it, uh, what I mean by that is is that you know what it means to have a critical thought is to have an experience which goes beyond something you can sort of conceptually articulate, right? So that to have a critical thought, to have something where we are, where we have a sort of critical experience, or a critical, critically reflective experience, is to have an experience where we are aware of something about the structure of our own thought, right? But we can't articulate it because if we, you know, if we were to articulate it, it would become another sort of part of the structure of our thought itself. But the experience is one that is critical of the very structure of our thought. So there's a paradox here that it's very critical, the very fact that it's critical means that we can't articulate it. And if we can articulate it, it's not critical anymore. Okay? So that's, that's sort of the, the paradox. And I think what Adorno means by philosophy, um, you know, critical philosophy, is that it sort of it takes concepts to this point where they reach something where they're almost, again, it never entirely succeeds, but that's crucial to what a critical thought is. You sort of, you move language, if you prefer, you know, to the point where it's about to, to say something, right? Where you lead it to the edge where it begins to reflect on the very things that it can't say, right? But of course, it can't quite move over the edge and say them because that would be, again, to assimilate what it can't say. But you move it to the edge where it becomes aware of the very things that it can't say without being able to say them. And what I want to say is, you know, that is the core of critical experience. Um, and any time we talk about criticism, that has to be the, the essence of what, what we mean. And I think, you know, for understanding it, Adorno is understanding that, um, at least this is the way, you know, I've, I've read him, but, but the sort of critiques of, of literature and, and sociology and everything else. Um, as he sees it, that possibility of critical thought, which in the book I, I call a kind of self-awareness, um, Adorno's term is Selbstbesinnung, which is sort of, it's self-reflection but not quite, it has more of a sense of self-awareness. It's that point when we're, 
you know, when, when we're sort of, we're, we're all aware of things, but it's been excluded from um, our, you know, academicized, if you like, ways of knowing and ways of assimilating and gathering knowledge. Um, so it, it, it is, in essence, a critique of, of an academic model of knowledge, of knowledge and idea of scholarship and everything else, if we think about it sort of deeply and, and how it's meant to work. Okay. Um, let, let me c come back then a minute from that, and um, I want to talk about sort of how um, how this emerges from to go back to aesthetics to see how. <coughs> What I want to say is the problem of aesthetics um, is really the, the core of the problem of knowledge and the problem of critical thinking that I've been talking about. And, um, and something that, that I'm trying to sort of come to um, in this book is, is an idea that, um, an idea really of, of how, again, if we think about knowledge properly, we have to be we have, to, we have to come to aesthetics a certain way and understand the aesthetic a certain way. Um, particularly, let me go, go back to, to Kant. And, and Kant makes um, a distinction between two things. He distinguishes the, the sort of the pleasure in the aesthetic and he distinguishes that from what's called, what he calls the sublime. Um, an aesthetic pleasure for Kant is something that we get when we experience, there's a sort of harmony it's almost like harmony of ourselves in the world. Um, you know, Kant talks of it as, as a harmony of, of intuition, um, our intuitions and our concepts. There's like a, you know, when, when we see a beautiful tulip, um, we're enjoying, you know, something, um, we're enjoying some beautiful appearance, but what's really going on is we're understanding the way our minds can actually latch onto nature. And that's a kind of form of, um, a form of pleasure. That's where the pleasure of the aesthetic comes from. So when we enjoy something, we're actually enjoying the harmony of our minds with, with the way the world actually works. And we're seeing that when we know something, we're actually in tune with the way things are. And that's why we experience this sort of um, aesthetic pleasure that Kant associates with any sort of aesthetic experience. Um, and you know, his examples are always pretty benign. You know, it's tulips and it's very sort of you know, it's walks in nature and that type of thing, uh, which he associates with the aesthetic. Um, now, the sublime is something very different. Um, and the, the sublime is something that I think is, is again, I'm going to say that this is crucial um, for understanding knowledge and understanding critical thinking and, and everything else. Um, now, whereas sort of, you know, the, 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 the experience of beauty for Kant is this very sort of sedate, experience where we see a tulip and how lovely, you know, we're just enjoying it. Um, the sublime is a much more frightening experience. And Kant gets it from Edmund Burke, um, an 18th century British thinker. And Burke calls it a sort of delightful terror, a delightful terror. And it's that sort of, there's a paradox in, um, in the sublime, and it's the unity of those two things, and something could be both you know, delightful and enjoyable, and at the same time, terrible and frightening, etc. Um, and Kant, you know, associates the sublime with things like, you know, it's, it's being on the, you know, you're on the cliff and there's this huge storm, um, and it's like, you know, you're in awe of this experience. Nature is suddenly very threatening. Nature is suddenly a really powerful, overpowering thing. Um, and there you are in front of this experience. Um, but at the same time, Kant says, you know, in spite of this threateningness, you then experience this sense of contentment almost, this sense of you enjoy this experience when you're in front of these raging storms. Um, and key to it, you know, you have to be in a place of safety. You know, if your life is really in danger, if, if you're in a little rowing boat out on the storm, you know, it's not, it's not going to work in the right way because fear is going to take over. Right? So you have to have the experience of fear, and at the same time you have to um, you have to be in a place of safety where you can experience that fear and that, at the same time um, take pleasure in that fear. Let me just quote you where where this comes out um, in Kant, and this is from the third critique. The satisfaction in the sublimity of nature is a feeling of the deprivation of the freedom of the imagination through itself. 
the imagination is sort of our, it's really our sensory apparatus for Kant, how we, how we're in touch with nature. Uh, the deprivation of the freedom of the imagination through itself in that it purposefully determined by another law than that of its empirical use. It acquires thereby an expansion and power which surpasses the one it sacrifices. But the basis of this power is hidden from it. Instead, the imagination feels the sacrifice and the deprivation, and at the same time, the cause to which it is being subordinated. To translate that, um, what Kant is actually saying here is that what happens in the sublime is we, it's almost like we feel a sense of satisfaction in our own, our own power over nature. And what, what, he, what Kant says happens is when we enjoy this experience of the sublime, we're actually enjoying the fact that even though there's these powerful storms and you know it looks really threatening, we, ex we experience the fact that nature can't actually touch us because we have this, this, this moral self, this individual freedom that nature can't touch. It can sort of destroy us physically, but Kant says, well, we're not just physical beings. We have this sort of noumenal freedom, this level of freedom that's beyond the physical world, and that's what nature cannot touch. Okay. That's what the sublime through nature cannot touch. So for Kant, the experience represented in the sublime is actually one of our own superiority over nature. Right? It's, it's the point where we take pleasure almost in this sense of our untouchability through nature, right? Nature can destroy our bodies, but then we have this sort of moral sense of superiority. And that's Kant's way of joining together these two things, the, the delight, the terror, right? The, the terror, but at the same time, the pleasure we take in that terror. Okay? Um, now, I think what I want to say, and what I'm, what I'm leading towards um, in drawing out this idea of, of criticism and everything else, and really where I want to push this sort of further um, it is that it's in the experience of the sublime actually represents something that is at, at the very core of the process of us knowing anything. In other words, at the very sort of origin of knowledge itself, at the origin of our sort of cognitive apparatus, there's this moment where we sort of turn away. There's this moment where we sort of reject nature in favor of our own um, conceptual schemes and our own ways of knowing things. That at the very core of knowledge is this, I don't know, of course, the domination of nature. Um, but I think the, the, way, the way I want to understand it is through the sublime, right? And to say that um, whenever we know something, we at the same time turned away from the way nature reveals itself to us. So knowledge, in that sense, is, is always associated with a kind of um, suppression. Knowledge is always associated with a kind of suppression of, of a level of sensuous engagement, if you like, with nature. Um, and I think, you know, where, where, does the, where does the inspiration of that come from? I, I think, you know, I'd certainly mention Marx and Freud as two really key, is, you know, inspirations for where, for where Adorno derives that from. And, and for Marx, I mean, the, the, the fundamental um, the fundamental idea would be, you know, the critique of alienation in the Paris manuscripts, um, and the critique of, of reification in, in Capital. And the, you know, particularly in, in the Paris manuscripts, I think you get this idea of, you know, capitalism. It's, it's not just, you know, like it later becomes a um, an economic analysis, but it's it's a it's a critique of a certain treatment of sensuous life in capitalism. Um, and by that I mean the way our the way our senses engage with the world, and it, and it, create, it produces a critique of capitalism as a kind of sensory domination, right? So what's at stake in capitalism is not just the, this sort of you know fact that it's exploitation. You know that's something that is, I would argue, sort of derived from this prior idea um, that capitalism is a kind of domination of, of the senses. And I think you know if if we were to sort of follow that down. When we read Capital, we, we'd read, um, you know, the famous critique of exchange value versus use value um, that's, that's in Capital. I think, you know, we, we'd read that again in terms of um, use value would be more along the lines of our sensuous 
sort of engagement with nature, how we create meaning by the fact that our, that our bodies are sensuously engaged with the natural world. And then we'd have to oppose that to exchange value, which is the way we create meaning by abstracting from the way our bodies are engaged with the natural world. Um, you know, exchange value is what something means. It's sort of, for Marx, it's a sort of quantified idea of value. And it's the value that you get of what something means by comparing it with other things at the same time. So it's an abstract idea of value. Use value is, is, is obviously a more sort of concrete, embodied way of, of determining the use of something. So you could well describe capitalism as something that sort of derives from this idea where use value takes over from, uh, sorry, exchange value takes over from use value. So, you know, that, that critique of, of sensuous, um, the, the sort of loss of sen sensuous embodiments or what I also um, like to call material presence is totally key to Marx. Um, and I think in Freud you could see that you could see the same thing where you've got, you know, repression domination is here the domination of internal nature. Right? And I think you, you know you could see you know the same mechanisms crop up as, as the sublime makes us, you know, it makes us fearful, it makes us anxious. In Freud you you know you have the moments where, you know, when internal nature threatens to reappear, repressed internal nature threatens to reappear. It's anxiety producing and everything else. So the, you know, the same things where it's something that is desired, but also something that is, that is repressed, or something that you are too fearful to face, keeps reproducing itself. And it's the structure of the sort of sublime. Um, so I think, you know, if, again, if, if you, there's a reading of Freud, and I think you know, Jonathan Lear is, is somebody who's very good on this reading, there's a reading of Freud where, where this idea of internal nature and repression um, can be read as, as one where you know, there's, there's a relation between our sort of rational cognitive selves and our interior sensory selves um, that, is, that has been sort of put out of whack by the, by the domination of the rational self over the sensory self. And what's needed um, you know, is, is a change in the way these two relate to one another. Um, and, you know, Leah has a, um, a hot description of this as love, and he sort of talks about the, this, what this involves and everything else. But I think, you know, it's, it's that same um, relation that I think we can find in Freud um, and Marx, the relation between the sort of sensory engagement, you know, our material presence in the world, um, as opposed to our sort of conceptual cognitive self, where the conceptual cognitive self sort of you know, founds itself by the domination of, of the sensor itself. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the sublime, and, and, you know, the great thing about the sublime is, is it's an experience that we, you know, we seek out so these experiences, you know. Um, not that we're all sort of always thrill seekers, but we, you know, we take pleasure in, in these experiences where, you know, we experience this sense of, of fear, this sense of putting ourselves in danger. But it's always a putting ourselves in danger from a safe place. Um, you know, so, so that it, it, in essence we know our lives are not really in danger, but we can sort of have that experience of, of sort of risking ourselves. And we seek the, these experiences, I think, you know, because we're, in doing this, we're rehearsing this process, which is at, at the core of the way our mental apparatus, our minds, and our cognitive apparatus works. That we do something that we, we repeat all the time when we, when we use language, when we use concepts. We, we're reworking this process of um, you know, the, the repression of nature in order to speak. And the, um, before I finish, I mean, the, the, there's a whole sort of tradition of, of working on this, and it comes from, um, a lot of it, particularly in French philosophy, comes from Hegel. Um, there's a famous quote in the Phenomenology where he says, but the life of the spirit is not frightened of death and does not keep itself pure of it. It endures death and maintains itself in it. Um, and what Hegel's, what Hegel's saying here, he's describing the way, you know, spirit, what he calls spirit, which we can call language to simplify here, um, the way it works by, um, you know, metaphorically killing the things that it relates to. So, 
you know, language can only be language by speaking about things as general, as general things. You know, however much we want to say this particular thing, we always end up speaking about generalities. Um, you know, so whenever we want to speak about a particular table, a particular chair, you know, we can't do it with language. We can point to it and we can sort of you know, point it out and that stuff. But language works by making it something we can share. Comparison with exchange value here, when we speak about the chair, it becomes something that we can um, relate to as an exchangeable property. The chair becomes a universal because we speak about it. it ceases to be a particular individual thing. Um, so it's, that's the thing that I think is, is, is crucial to this interpretation. So what, what I'm trying to do in, in the book really is, is say that um, you know, that, if that's the way language works, then our problem is, is really this, that we have to, a critique of language can only be a sort of interior resistance to conceptual language. You know, you can never use conceptual language to, um, you know, really substantively criticize it. But what you can do is to use it in such a way that you resist what happens in conceptual language. And as anybody who's actually, you know, read anything of Adorno knows, um, it's a struggle. It's a real struggle to, to read. And, you know, it, it's not a struggle, I want to say, because, you know, it's accidentally. Um, it's a struggle because what's going on when he's writing is this process of trying to use language to criticize the way that language works to kill sensuous being, to kill the material presence of things that we relate to. So it's always sort of directing us back that when we use a concept, something is lost when we used it. There is something that has gone missing when we've made it something we can relate to by using a concept, right? By using a general term. And it's trying to turn us back to, you know, whatever happens when we use concepts, this thing that's gone missing, this material presence that's gone missing when we use it. So it's that, you know, when I was talking about critique, it's that idea that we, you know, you use concepts to, to make concepts aware of what happens when you use them to make concepts aware of, of the way they take us away from material presence. So it's, it's in that sense, an internal resistance. So you can never, and of course, that's you know, the paradox and the problem, um, and why he's hated by so many philosophers, that you can never explicitly state it, you know, you can never say, you can never explicitly state it as a thesis, not because, um, you know, not, not because just you don't want to, but because to state it as a thesis again corrupts the point of, of what you're trying to say, which is an internal critique. Um, so let me, uh, yeah, let, let me, let, yeah, that's sort of in a nutshell what I'm trying <laughs> to do um, in the book. Let me let me leave it there. That it does, where when you you know when you say something, you know you, you want to say you want to say here it is now, but you know you, you know here, here I am now in front of this book. But when you said it, you know time has already moved on. So it now when you say now, it's become something else. <laughs> um, so so you know that, that's sort of that's the the birth of the generality of language for, for Hegel. That, you know, language takes us away from physical immediacy. You know, it takes us away from sensuous embodiment of it, and it takes us to the general. Um, and for Hegel, that's not, you know, he, he's, he's not saying that's a bad thing. You know, what, what he wants to say is, well, eventually, you know, you can recuperate what's gone missing by 
you know, reading the phenomenology of spirit. Um, you know, you know, you, you can get to the stage where you can recuperate, you can get back to that material presence that's gone missing um, by by sort of understanding the concepts in their entirety. You know, say more than any individual concept. Um, so for, for for him, it's it's not really it's really understanding. You know, the sort of Hegelian philosophy wants to resolve it in a different way. You know, the problem is still there, but Hegel thinks he can resolve it through through philosophy. Um, and Adorno's approach is more that you know you can never actually you can never sort of resolve it philosophically. It's something that you you become aware of again and again, and you can point to, but it's always a it's always something that is going to recur because it's intrinsic to language. So Adorno's perspective is is one of where you, you always have to be vigilant about this internal critique of what's going on in language. There's no philosophical solution, uh, whereas Hegel thinks there is a philosophical solution. So that that's sort of the big the big difference, I think. Okay. Um, so I, I have two questions. I don't know if either of them are going to come out, but the. Uh so the internal critique that you're describing Adorno doing, is that negative dialectics for him? So that's, that's the first question. Um, and then the second question is kind of like Rebecca's question, but taking it to the marks, because in the way that you're talking about the uh, this distinction between the kind of thing in itself or the kind of natural world and the ways in which language can't get at that, I mean, which is, a, from my, I mean, again, I'm, this is from ages ago. But this is the kind of classical philosophical divide that, that Hegel tried to overcome through the spirit and you know in the kind of ideal. My understanding, you know, thinking about Marx philosophically, was his understanding of materialism similarly overcame that that break in the way that he embraces materialism. And I'm thinking specifically like in terms of alienation. When you the question of sensuousness. I mean, so, and maybe I kind of lost.